in some subtle way, that is also a threat. Mm. In our community, we do it this way. Implied is the threat. You don't follow, we throw you out. Mm. You're no longer a member. You might as well go to hell. <laughs> so it's back to that again. People are not easily intimidated anymore. As you're speaking, I'm, real, I'm realizing how silly I may sound when I'm saying some of this stuff, or just my thinking on it. It's but, but that's so common, the, that mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. Hey, you want to be a member of this community? Here's how we do it. Well, the Nazis said the same thing. This is what we do. Oh, okay. So, let's start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Montclair, small town named Montclair, New Jersey. Oh, I heard of it. You've heard of Montclair? Yeah, it's... um. So many people hearing about it. My parents had to end up moving out, getting priced out. But it's a beautiful town, very diverse. Yeah, Jewish cemetery there. Really? What? Which one? I don't know. But one's all right. So yeah, this a uh, large, large Jewish community. Um, probably my closest next door neighbors, the closest neighbors that I had, um, were were of the Jewish faith. And I wish I would have asked more questions then. But uh, you know, when you're a kid. Everything in its right time. Everything in its right time. Yeah. So I, I'm very appreciative to grow up there. Like I said, I grew up like my norm that I grew up with. Um, I realized when I went to prep school in college that that was not the norm <laughs> for everybody else. Um, like I said, very diverse. I grew up. I look back at my school pictures, you know, all different backgrounds. Um, but there's there's. And I'm probably just saying this for the first time, but there are some to go along with all the positives, a lot of negatives um, or just things that you miss out on when um, it may be a community that all is aligned and united, whether that's spiritually, religious um, and other areas culturally, I should say, uh, you, you miss out on some of those things. And um, that's kind of where I've been like circling back to understand and appreciate when I drive through you know, this neighborhood, and I see just the camaraderie. Um, that's something that, you know, I've missed. And some of those things that I appreciate. Now, that may be my perspective. It may not be. That you noticed that. Yeah. Oh, well, 100 percent. You know, you know what else I noticed that. Uh, so I'm, I'm driving. I, I actually parked here and then I went to go meet a friend. I took an Uber there and I came back and then the Uber on the way back. I'm just noticing how many kids are outside compared to. Um, you know, a lot of other neighborhoods where, you know, I grew up, you know, still playing outside and whatnot, but now it's more just video games, you know, playing on the phone in most neighborhoods, but just seeing that connection, just seeing a connection of people that um, share the same ideals, share the same principles. Um, to me, that's, that's something that as I'm driving by, I say, you know, what if, what if I can have this for, for my people? Now, of course, we just kind of talked a little bit offline about what my people is. Um, it's a struggle that, you know, something that I think about all the time, but struggle to find out who is my people and my people, you know, just dark skinned people, black, quote unquote, black people. Is it people that, you know, have the same thoughts as me, same political group, same religion, same all these different things? What exactly is my people? So I always come back to um, energy and energy, not not on the, like stars and the moons, but just from a standpoint of um sharing the same common foundational principles, you know, sharing the same things as far as um, how you treat others, um, your, your unity and commitment to your family. You know, that's how I now see my people as. Mm -hmm. Or just good people. Good people. That's, <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because it's, uh, I feel like we're in a time now where we're at war in a lot of ways, with, with good people, good principles, good morals, and then all the temptations and influences of what's on the other side of that. Um, I feel like that's, uh, maybe that's just my position from my perspective. I don't know if you feel the same, but, or maybe that's, we're always, you know, fighting against, you know, it's the good versus evil fight. I think the, the good versus evil is the old model. Mm. It used to be. Mm -hmm. That's how it lined up. Mm -hmm. Good, bad. Mm -hmm. 
I think today it's like sane and insane. Wow. <laughs> no? Yeah. I, it's not even evil. It's just crazy. You know, that's a good, I, I think that's a good way of looking at it because there's certain stuff that in society that I see, uh, I don't know how deep we want to get into it, but, you know, just got a text from a friend of mine where it's, you know, he's has a six year old, you know, in elementary school and the emails that they're getting, you know, the, you know, Pride Month this, you know, all, all this other stuff where it's hard for me to understand how certain people are OK with certain things where it makes sense to them where a lot of these people, like you said, it's not like they're doing it with evil intent. They may even be doing it thinking that they're heroes in a lot of ways. But I'm looking at it like, yeah, you, know, you can't you can't be serious and thinking that this is OK. But. That's different. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different struggle today. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not like the 30s, for example, mm -hmm. where there are some pretty malevolent people. Mm hmm. They were out to destroy. Mm -hmm. Today, I think you're right. Everybody thinks they're doing good. Yeah. And it's crazy. And that may be even more of a dangerous time, how I look at it. Because when people are, are standing up, when things are so radicalized, where you have the more extreme this side is, the more extreme that side is, then you have what I would think, I would hope, the majority of people in the middle, but they're getting pushed to either side. It's almost like a fanatic, um, a fan of a sport, rather than looking at things as like, okay, what makes sense? We're just going to root for the Dallas Cowboys. They could be the worst team in the league, but because we're fans, we think they're the best, so we'll rationalize everything based off of that, rather than looking at the reality of the overall good of the people. That's kind of how I see things. Everything's, everything's radical. Everything is, and people will compromise their morals and values just to avoid the, oh, the, well, that other side, you know, because the fear mongering and everything like that. I have conversations with my parents all the time, and, you know, it, it just goes all over the place. They're going to sacrifice their values. Mm -hmm. They're going to sacrifice their kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is crazier than. It, it is. It is. So, what's missing simply is a little bit of information and clarity. That's all. How do you get that to a group of people? So let me kind of back up a little bit. I would assume that culture plays a major role in that. Um, and culture and community to me goes hand in hand. So when I see what I perceive as your culture, I see a lot more community, a lot more unity. Um, when I think about my culture, I see a lot of commitment, but commitment to the wrong areas, commitment to destructive music, destructive lifestyles, destructive choices overall. Um, I don't know how to get people on board and to see things with the clarity that I hope I see things with. It's not difficult. That's the good news. Mm -hmm. That is promising. The good news is we always believed deep down inside everybody's good. Mm -hmm. We said it. We didn't really believe it. Yeah. <laughs> like deep, down good. deep down inside everybody should be good. Mm -hmm. But they're not. Mm -hmm. That was the reality, right? Mm -hmm. I think today... People don't know enough to be evil. Mm. Wow. Yeah. You don't know enough even to be responsible for your sins. We just don't know. The average kid in the street has no idea what the Ten Commandments are. Mm. They don't even they've never even heard the movie. <laughs> I'm I'm sitting here as you're saying that, and I'm like, I couldn't I couldn't give them to you. I know the movie. But I couldn't give you the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. that, and that's sad. Yeah, that is sad. But it's worse than that. You don't know what the Ten Commandments consist of. I'm talking about people who don't know what you're talking about when you say Ten Commandments. They have no idea. Mm. Where is that from? Constitution? Is that from the Bill of Rights? 
Which commandment? They have no idea. They never heard about it. Never. School didn't teach it. Parents didn't teach it. So what do you expect of these kids? You know, these kids go on riots and they're looting stores. And you stop them and you say, what are you doing? I'm helping myself to some goods. So what that's stealing. What is that? Yeah. No one ever said thou shalt not steal to these kids. Never. Yeah, it can't be on the kids. It's got to be on the, the guidance and leadership, right? I'm not looking to blame. Mm -hmm. It's just the reality is there's no information out there. So you can't even argue with somebody. Say, oh, but that's against the Ten Commandments. <laughs> they don't know what you're like, talking about. <laughs> Nothing. So the worst part of it is, I had this little incident. This um, father calls me from Israel. Mm -hmm. His 12-year-old daughter got it into her head that God is angry at her. And she's depressed. How old is she? 12. <laughs> and she got into her head that God is angry at her. Yeah. And they tried everything. Psychology and, and r rabbis. And... and then he does this nasty little thing. He says, here, talk to her. And puts her on the phone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I said to her, God is angry at you? She says, yeah. I said, I'm so jealous. She says, what? I said, you're 12 years old and you can get God angry? When did you become so important? <laughs> That's it. Her problem was gone. Let's suppose God was angry with her. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Right. God knows me. God's knows paying you. attention to me. Exactly. He notices you. He pays attention to you. And what you do matters to him. And you're 12 years old. So when you say, you're sinning, you're violating God's laws, it's such a compliment. Right? Because that means you count. The worst thing you can do to people is not tar and feather or burn them at the stake. The worst thing you can do with people is say, whether you're moral or not doesn't matter. You're not that important. Mm -hmm. That is the most dehumanizing and the most destructive thing you can do to a person. To not hold a person responsible for their, for their morality, that is so degrading. It's, it's worse than anything. So, people who never heard of a commandment never heard that God cares. Hmm. They don't know that they matter. So, what they do can't matter. If they don't matter, right. that's what's happening today. The vast majority of people in the world are convinced that they don't matter. So you want me to take my behavior seriously? Come on. Doesn't make sense. Is this the quote unquote freedom that everybody's striving for? And I guess it's disguised as? Well, they always said, you know, knowledge is freedom, but not mathematics. Knowledge of mathematics doesn't give you freedom. Mm -hmm. Gives you a headache. <laughs> That's true. That's I true. I don't like math. You're, but, you're not a math guy. <laughs> yeah. But even if you're good at it, mm -hmm. that, that doesn't set you free. Right. What does? The only knowledge that sets you free is knowledge of why God created you. Well, first of all, that God created you. Yeah. And, Getting and into why. that part first. So, a very interesting. Mark Twain has a famous quote which is, I mean, it says it all. He said, there are two significant days in your life. The day you're born 
and the day you figure out why. Mm. That is so powerful. Mm. That's it. That's the whole story. And that's been the the latter is probably the place that I've been in for the last couple of years. Figuring out why. Figuring out why. Figuring out my purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, I can I can play certain things. Oh, oh, you play football. That's an achievement. Um, a lot of times I'll disguise focusing on or avoid focusing on my purpose to go after achievements that I create for myself and that I say, oh, this is once I once I get this, I'll feel good. Once I get this car, once I once I get this point, once I can move here rather than what's my purpose? What am I here for? Uh, what's really going to fill me up and make me whole and fulfill that potential that I know I was given. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's like Chinese food. And it feels good while you're eating it. The moment <laughs> later, you're hungry again. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good way of looking at it. It's a good way because every achievement that I thought would feel good and would be that next thing, you know, oh, well, once I get here, I get there and it's kind of like, yeah. all right, let me just try to drown this lack of feeling rewarding and full with just focusing on the next achievement. And it's, and it's never going to lead me to where I want to go um, and the, the impact that I want to have. So in some way, COVID woke us up to that fact. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I agree. No, you're not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. You're, yeah. not, you're not yeah. playing sport. You're mm-hmm. not going to work. You're not going to school. You're not even going to the church or the synagogue. You're staying home. Now figure out who you are. Mm. Stop running around being busy. Mm. And it it matured us. What you just described is how I envision Shabbat impacts people. When you can disconnect, when you when you take when you have that much of a commitment to stop everything that you're doing for for a day out the week. Not talk about business, not talk about this, not to be with your family. Don't be on TikTok all day, you know, scrolling. Be with your family. And that's something that I was fortunate enough to have where my dad, when he came home and sat at the dinner table, it was family time. It was turn the TV shows off. Um, what did you do in school today? What did you learn? Uh, what's going on in your life? We had that. And I know a lot of my other friends, stuff that I used to complain about, it was everything that a lot of my friends, they didn't have and i see how it impacted them compared to how i was fortunate enough to have that where where did your father get it from i don't know i i t- i well my my dad being the youngest of nine kids um i i would say he got it from his mother um and his father but in different ways my grandfather was not the the talkative type not really uh, my dad could probably recall on his hand how many times they really had extended conversations. But maybe him missing that, um, he he was the opposite to us. My dad hugged, kiss us. He still hugged and kiss us to this day, my brother and I. And I feel like he always wanted to have a certain connection and, and a certain openness with his kids that he didn't necessarily have. That's impressive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a cheat code for me. It's been a cheat code my whole life. And as I get older and mature more, I start to realize just how important and just how simple, like you said, when you said it's not hard to get back to that community feel. I I get it. I get it. I can't necessarily explain it to other people who didn't have that experience, um, but I know just how important it was for me in my development. There's a woman who wrote a book. She's a child psychologist. She wrote a book called The Lessons of a Skinned Knee. Lessons of a Skinned Knee. I'm not sure where the title came from. Mm-hmm. She makes one very, very interesting point as a psychologist. Mm-hmm. She says when she went to school, she, she understood that she would be treating children who come from disadvantaged families, broken families, 
or um, troubled families. Mm -hmm. She's been a psychologist now for, you know, child psychologist for a dozen years. None of her clients come from broken families, from disadvantaged families, or from, or from troubled families. Mm -hmm. Then why do they have issues? Mm. And this bothered her. It was like it was on the back of her mind constantly. And then one day she went to a class, a study group in her synagogue. And they studied the laws of honoring parents. One of the Ten Commandments. And anybody who knows anything mm -hmm. says, well, I, yeah, I do that. Yeah, really? How does one honor parents? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> they, they, it, yeah, you have good intentions, but right. you, you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. How do you honor your parents? So they're going through the laws of honoring parents. And one of the things that the, that the text said was, you honor your parents by not sitting in their chair. Don't sit in your father's chair or your mother's chair, even when they're not in the house. And she had an epiphany. She said, that's it. And since then, every child client that she has, she says, do you sit in your father's chair? And they say, yes. She says, okay, that's where the problem begins. Stop. Don't sit in your father's chair. I didn't read the whole explanation, the whole book of it, but that, that rang with, with truth. Mm -hmm. If you can sit in your father's chair, you have no idea who you are. Mm -hmm. Are you someone's child? Do you have a parent? Or are you a mushroom that sprang out of... You don't sit in your father's chair, you know who you are. You're standing on solid ground. Mm. You like it, you don't like it, it doesn't matter. It's sanity. If you can sit in your father's chair, then, then what's a father? Do you have a father? Are you a child? Are you a son? Are you a daughter? So you blur the lines, and all of a sudden you don't know anything. Don't know who you are. Something as basic as, <laughs> I, after that, I was talking to an 11-year-old kid, with a troubled kid. So you sit in your father's chair? He says, yeah. I said, you call him by his first name? Yeah. I said, that's a problem. He says, why? <laughs> I didn't know. I was just processing that whole right. idea. I said, uh, let me ask something else. Do, does your dog sleep in your bed? Yeah. I said, that's a problem. I said, why? I don't know. It, it, it feels like a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. It's a problem. <laughs> the borders are very right. vague. Mm -hmm. Your dog sleeps in your bed. You sit in your father's chair. Mm -hmm. Are there any? There's no roles. There's nothing established here. Yeah. So I asked this kid. He was a very bright kid. I liked him. Mm -hmm. I said, you come home from... Little League, you walk in the door, you got a bat over your shoulder, and you find your father and dog killing each other. Who are you going to hit with the bat? This is what this kid said. Depends who started it. <laughs> you hear that? Now, this is a moral kid. Justice. Well, who started it? It's a dog and your father. And you want to know who started it? See? Stop sitting in your father's chair. How do we get to that point? <laughs> Just like that. And she says that since she did that, her success rate is of a different, of a different category. Mm -hmm. Because just that alone takes half the problems away. So that's what I'm saying. There's just, there's just no sanity. Is that attached to us not? And I don't know. It's almost been 
like the cool thing to not identify with a religion. You know what I mean? In, in certain communities, I will, I'll say the people that I'm around, it's people want free thinking, free this, free that. And I've gotten to the point where when I first stepped away from Christianity, uh, I probably thought like that. Um, now I understand the importance of having structure. Um, we need religion. People are not capable of leading themselves. It just is what it is. I can sit here and say, uh, oh, in a perfect world, this would be this, this would be that. I'm looking at things right now. We are lost. There's no structure. And people are fighting for, for freedom, not even understanding the connection with chaos that it brings and the lack of appreciation. It's almost like the grass is greener on the other side. Like we grew up religious, you know, say you grew up religious and there's people on the other side that are, oh, oh that looks good over there. Like they're freedom, they, they can do whatever they do. And you only see the, the good side of that type of stuff. And to me, that's where I've seen a lot of maybe just American culture in general, Western culture just shift. Um, because it's not, I, I used to sit here and, and think of, um, Oh, this is happening to me. I'm going back to another one of your videos. I didn't want to say that. But, you know, you start to think this is happening to me, my people. But when you look at it, this is a bigger, this is a bigger thing. This is a, a larger cultural issue that we're having. I don't know why um, people are pushing it a certain way. Maybe it's just so they can be in control. Um, I don't know. But to me, when I look at it, it is insane, back to what you're saying, it's insane the direction that we're moving in. Because, and, and why I say it's insane, it's literally, the writing's on the wall. You're, you're, you're running towards a negative direction that's not conducive to you being successful. All the things that, if we sat here and say, what's important to you? Where do you want to get to? They're running in the opposite direction that's going to lead them to that, but people feel that they have the right to, and because they have the right to, let's do it. Or, I, I, it's it's very confusing and very frustrating. So, so one of the problems with religion, mm -hmm. it provides a an, uh, structure, mm -hmm. it provides borders and outline to mm -hmm. where where you go, where you don't go, what you do, what you don't do, very very organized. Mm -hmm organized religion right but some of that structure is artificial mm. and it's going to backfire so you can't just make up a structure and expect people to be satisfied so you have cultures where it's not the religion it's the government that gives you structure mm -hmm. tells you how many kids you can have mm. and where you can live and where you can go and what you can say and what you can't say, ooh, that is structure. But it's destructive mm -hmm. because it's not true. So you can't just make up a structure. Just like you can't just make up a religion. Mm -hmm. People are going to see through it and they're going to rebel because it doesn't, it doesn't sit right. Intuitively, it doesn't feel right. And then there's another thing. We, we are living in a very free world, and that's much better mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than the alternative. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. Agreed. Today, you can't come and tell anybody, you must do this. When you say you must, the rest of the sentence is not going to be heard. They don't even hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me I must. Mm -hmm. Even if you say the most normal the most reasonable, the most necessary, the most obvious thing. Mm -hmm. Don't beat your wife. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me what to do. So it's not that they believe in beating their wives, mm -hmm. but you can't tell them not to. But if you present them with the information, beating a wife is not going to get you anywhere. Okay. I never really wanted to beat her anyway. Mm -hmm. I did it because you told me not to. Mm -hmm. right? So 
you can't impose. You've got to cultivate it from within. You've got to get the person to appreciate the valid, the, the, the validity and the value, and then do it because of their own conviction. Dictatorship doesn't work. Never did. And particularly today when, you know, who are you to tell me? One of the things I wrote down was, I, I relate stuff to either sports, business, you know, different things. And it was, how do you incentivize? You know, how do you incentivize somebody to buy in to a particular way of life, culture, um, anything? And that's what I'm hearing from you, where in the past, I may have just told people, hey, do this. Like, we got to do this. We got to figure it out. A, B, and C, it's simple, just do it. And just like you said, when you tell people you have to do this, there's automatically going to be a certain level of pushback. But it's how do, how do we incentivize certain people with information to where we can show them the benefits of carrying out certain actions and behavior of where that will lead them in the long run? So... We, we can't insult people's intelligence. So to look at a person and say, how do I get this idiot <laughs> to behave himself? How do I, what incentive can I give mm -hmm. him? Mm -hmm. It's not going to work mm -hmm. because you don't believe in the person's potential. Mm. You have to come with the assumption everybody wants to do the right thing. Show him that it's right, and you don't have to incentivize. He'll, he's got his own incentives. You have to expose the truth and believe that people will recognize truth when they hear it. If you don't believe that, your whole education system falls apart. Yeah. Then you're going to trick them into being good? How long is that going to last? Not long. <laughs> See, and that's why... Again, religion has to keep up with the times in certain ways. Fire and brimstone, heaven and hell. I don't know if anybody noticed, but it's not working. Mm -hmm. Not working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Promise me heaven? I'm not interested. Because What else that, you got? <laughs> yeah, because you're not telling me the truth. You're just scaring me. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not going to be scared anymore. And if you have to f threaten me or bribe me, then obviously what you're selling is not true. There's like a built-in contradiction. If it were true, why do you have to pay me to do it? Take me to heaven. And, and, and if what is wrong is wrong, then, then that's the reason not to do it. What are you telling me about hell? So... The, the, the conversation breaks down immediately. Oh, don't do that. You're going to go to hell. You have nothing else to say about right and wrong, good and bad, wisdom and foolishness. You go immediately to the threat. You're not a teacher. You're not an inspiration. You're a bully. So now, you, now we're doing the same thing that we're complaining about. It's almost like we're trying to solve the, the quote-unquote problem with the same tactics that we're complaining about as far as what the problem presents. So, is there heaven and is there hell? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but is that all you have to say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's reducing it to the most... Selfish of motives. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not true. People don't need to be bribed or threatened. When they hear something true, they know it, they love it, they appreciate it, and, and you don't need to say another word. They'll, they'll go for it. If you don't believe that, then close every school mm. and every church. Because... You, you don't believe in the people you're teaching. Not going to work. 
a tough, tough place to be in. Um, I, I know that that's something I need to check myself on because I've gotten to the point where it's discouraging enough to where I don't believe in certain people. I don't believe in people overall that, as I said earlier, that people can just find their way. I guess what I'm more so addressing is we just haven't figured, I haven't figured out a way to present the information in a way to where they could take heed to it, um, embrace it, uh, rather than just kind of pushing away from it. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge, but it's definitely doable. Mm -hmm. How is it so, first off, I have to say, is it? Because I'm speaking from a, a naive standpoint in a lot of ways. When I look at like my community compared to what I would say is your community, I look at it and say, and I say this to my friends, and my friends would get mad at me. And I say, well, you know, the Jewish community is doing this. They're doing this. They're doing this. And it sound, and it from the looks of it, from the outside, it seems so seamless and just systematic in a good way, to where it's like this is these are our principles, these are our morals, these are our values. This is the culture that was created based on these principles, values, and morals. And this is how this is the direction that we're moving in. This is where you fit in. And that's how we're going to go. That's how we're going to proceed. I know it may not be as simple as that, you know, from from your standpoint, but that's looking at it from my my standpoint. In some subtle way, that is also a threat. Mm. In our community, we do it this way. Implied is the threat. You don't follow, we'll throw you out. You're no longer a member. You might as well go to hell. <laughs> so it's back to that again. So to say this is how we, even, even in a family, mm -hmm. parents will say, in this house, in this home, we don't. Who's we and who decided? Like, and, and what are you saying? You're saying if I don't keep in step, I'm going to suffer. I'll be excluded. I'll, you know, you're out of the will. It's not. People are not easily intimidated anymore. As you're speaking, I'm real. I'm realizing how silly I may sound when I'm saying some of this stuff, or just my thinking on it. It's but, silly. But that's so common. The, that mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. Hey, you want to be a member of this community? Here's how we do it. Well, the Nazis said the same thing. This is what we do. Oh, okay. So, let's start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Is there right and wrong? Is anything really right? And is anything really wrong? Aside from consequences? Uh, don't put your hand in the socket. Don't put your finger in the socket. Don't touch the stove. Yeah. Oh, because it's wrong? No, because it's painful. <laughs> You're not telling me right from wrong. Mm -hmm. You're warning me of suffering. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. I, I need the warning. Mm -hmm. But don't tell me you just taught me morality. You didn't teach me morality. You didn't tell me why there is a right and a wrong. Oh, that's not right. You can't. Do you have no right to do that. I don't? Yeah, hey, watch me do it. <laughs> what do you mean I don't have the right? What does that even mean? Some guy wrote a book. Uh, some guy. Uh, the guy who started Boys Town in Kansas. Yeah, he was a very early uh, child psychologist and he started a, a Boys Town for orphans or He wrote a book called Whatever Became of Sin. Whatever Became of Sin. Where did all the sins go? Yeah. And, he, and he shows how slowly over time what used to be a sin became a crime. 
what used to be a crime became antisocial behavior. Okay. You see that, that? The transition. And all of a sudden, it's an alternative lifestyle. <laughs> what happened to sin? And the reason he wrote the book is because he delivered a lecture to a group of priests, young priests, mm -hmm. on the psychology of child raising, whatever. Mm -hmm. Brilliant stuff, right? Mm -hmm. After he, They were so impressed that after he finished speaking, they came over to him and said, where can we learn more about this? And he was horrified. He says, you don't learn more about this. You do your job so that I don't have that many clients. Yeah. He was saying, you don't teach them right from wrong. They're all going to come to me. That's, that's not the way it's supposed to be. You teach them right from wrong. You tell them certain things are a sin. Does that establish the foundation for everything moving forward? We're getting closer. Mm -hmm. That also has to be done with a little wisdom. Mm -hmm. Talking to this mother who is an evangelical uh, speaker, and she says, my daughter, 14 years old, was arrested for shoplifting. Not a candy bar. She had this whole plot. Her older friend worked at the cash register in a Target store. So she filled up a cart with merchandise, mm -hmm. like over $400 worth of stuff, mm -hmm. took it to her friend's register. The friend rang it up as $14. And she was halfway out the door and they caught her. So she says, my daughter, here I am, the preacher, and, the, and my daughter gets a arrested for shoplifting, how embarrassing that is. Mm -hmm. And the worst part of it, she says, my daughter is not even repentant. Mm -hmm. I say, why should she be? It's your religion, not hers. She says, that's exactly what she said. I said, I know, I hear it from all the teenagers. Their father or mother have a religion. What do you want from me? So I asked her, did you ever tell your daughter that God does not want her to steal? She says, you know, we don't talk like that. We taught her to love God. Okay, this is what you get. She loves God, and she also likes $400 worth of merchandise. Like what? You never said to her, God doesn't want you to steal? Mm -hmm. What's missing here? Two things. First of all, thou shalt not steal. Who said? What is a house rule? The, the rule of the land? It's a political rule? It's the police? Who said don't steal? You never told her that God said don't steal? No. Secondly, if God says don't steal to you, doesn't that make you more important, more significant? God doesn't tell birds not to steal. They steal all the time. Mm -hmm. And the squirrels steal from the birds. Everybody steals. God comes to the human being and says, not you. Oh, why? Because of you, I need something better. Come on, the compliment there. All of a sudden, I'm significant. Somebody's paying attention. What I do does matter. And to whom? The creator of the world. <laughs> no less. Then you have a chance. So you've got to start by saying, I just spoke to a group of of tourists. Mm -hmm. We have an a organized tour okay. of Crown Heights. It's very fascinating. Okay. From all over the country. Uh, for 5,000 years, give or take, 
we have been raised to believe that we, human beings, are very weak, very needy, very dependent, very fragile, very tiny, insignificant, mm. and we exist only by the grace of God. So we have to be very careful to be on God's good side. Otherwise, we're not going to get what we need. That's backwards. We're, even religion has bought into this. We're in trouble. We were born in sin. We need to be saved. We need to be protected. We need to get to heaven. And God is there to take care of all of that. So who serves whom? Mm -hmm. mm. He is there for my needs? There's something wrong with that. Something seriously wrong. That means I'm God and he's my valet. Mm -hmm. eh? <laughs> and then if he doesn't do what I expect him to do, mm -hmm. now I hate him. Mm -hmm. He's fired. Mm -hmm. Can't rely on him. <laughs> I've been there. I've been there. Right? So the truth has to be the opposite. We are not needy. Only the creator has a need. A creation has no needs. Like, it, this is so enlightening. I was created. Why do I have needs? Wow. I hadn't been created, I wouldn't have to do anything. The creator of the whole universe who creates all of this, he doesn't need anything. That don't make no sense at all. But all this was for nothing? The creator, theologically, right? Mm -hmm. The creator is perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Why in the world would someone who's already perfect create such a mess? <laughs> Why would he create anything? He's perfect. He shouldn't do anything. So if he does, he's after something really important. He needs his creation to be what he designed it to be, or I have needs. <laughs> Even if I do, it's only for 80 years. Mm -hmm. and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. And my needs change from year to year. What I needed yesterday, no thanks. I don't want it anymore. I don't need it anymore. So it's so my needs. Mm -hmm. it's... So I was saying to these people, get up off your knees. Stop begging. You got it all wrong. The Torah is not here to warn you that if you don't behave, you're going to get punished. The Torah is here because God wanted to let us know what he needs. Now, so, you look at all the commandments and you say, why do I need to do that? I don't need to do that. I don't need to keep to keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I don't need to keep kosher. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with a McDonald's mm -hmm. cheeseburger? <laughs> Aside for health problems. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't need these laws. I don't need them. Mm -hmm. I might go to hell if I don't do it. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to take that risk. Part of life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Art of death. And and religious leaders, teachers, try to convince you, yeah, you do need it. Oh, you need it. You need it. And if I press them, in the final analysis, they're going to say, oh, you're going to go to hell. Okay. So you don't know either, right? So you resort to threats. 
The truth is, I don't need to be good. Oh, you can get in trouble. Stop threatening me. Tell me something significant. I don't need to be good. You know why? Because I don't even need to be here. I didn't ask to be born. I don't need to be born. If I wasn't born, I would never complain. <laughs> How did I get to be needy? I need to get a job. I need to pay bills. I need to buy a house. I need to pay a mortgage. I need to go to school. I need... I don't need any of this. Sorry. I did not create myself. So I am not responsible for anything that's happening here. So it's absolutely true. I don't need, I don't need, period. I don't need to go to heaven because that's where I came from. So just leave me there and avoid all this mess. On the other hand, God is so needy. His need is as big as the universe. Bigger. Because it justifies the existence of the universe. Mm -hmm. So he has a real need. And I'm sitting here thinking, do I need this? Do I need that? Play these little games. We are here to serve him. Because his need is real. And if I can have these two convictions, number one, I don't need anything. Ooh, psychologically, that is so healthy. Mm. That's it. I'm free. Right. Real freedom. On the other hand, I am here because I'm necessary in God's plan. Like, he can be angry at me. <laughs> That's So, you wake up in the morning, you have no needs whatsoever, and therefore I can't threaten you, because you don't care. Oh, oh, you don't do this, you're going to die. Don't threaten me. Mm -hmm. Those days are over. So, on the one hand, I, I wake up without any burden. But God is st sitting there waiting for me to do something for him. How do you say no to that? Yeah. Yeah. That, him. It, it's all I'm hearing. I'll tell you what I'm hearing. That what we're seeing, all these complaints that I'm having about the world that we live in, are the result of trying to incentivize people with threats rather than knowledge, information, and purpose. And purpose means whose purpose? God's purpose. Because it's the if it's only one there is. Yeah, because when we think of it, but that's when I look at the world that we live in now, everybody's focused on me, my purpose, even families. Like there's not even a commitment to do stuff, unite with your family. So here I am, I ask questions. I've, written, I've wrote down certain questions of how do we unite as a community? And I look around and immediate families. I'm not talking about your, your third cousins, your fourth cousins. Literally, the people that are in the household with you, we don't see ourselves as united. Everything is, I'm going to go to college so I can do this. I'm going to move here. My family's all over the place. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's very weird to me what we've now turned into our norm. So we come along and we say, okay, Here's the plan. God came down, Mount Sinai, gave us commandments. Mm -hmm. He's got this whole thing, and you got to serve him, and you got to worship him, and you got to do that. Mm -hmm. So, oh, you mean I should become religious? No. <laughs> no, don't become religious. It's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's about him. So if you do what he asks you to do that makes you religious, how do you change the subject from him to you? Mm. So God comes and says, please, honor your parents. Uh, will that make me a righteous person? What do, what do you do that? 
I, I mean, how dare you do that? Mm -hmm. God says, I need you to do this. And you say, oh, well, will it get me to heaven? What, what, what are you doing? You don't need to be rewarded to do what you were created for. It's, it's the most natural truth. And you need to be paid? It's like on the jobs. People expect raises for doing what you just get paid to do, what's in your contract. Um, I, I've had conversations with people recently where, you know, just people, you come into a job, you're excited about it. You know, the first day, first year, you're actually doing more. You're doing more. You're going above and beyond. Then you start to get comfortable. You know, you're getting your benefits, everything else. And now you're doing less, but you're still expecting more. to get rewarded more. And it's a it's a, a backwards mindset, but it's one that makes sense to a lot of people. It's a good it's a good analogy. If you have a job you love, mm -hmm. you don't really care whether you get paid. I you know I can use the money, but that's true. So if God gives you a job working for him. You need to get paid. Not nice. So God says, I'm depending on you. I need you to do this for me. Will it get me to heaven? Otherwise, I'm not doing it. Negotiating with God. That's so nasty. Mm -hmm. There's another thing. Marriages are supposed to reflect our relationship with God. I'll marry you if, no thanks. I'll marry you if you're rich. I'll marry you if you have a really cool car or motorcycle. All right, you're not marrying me. You're marrying the car. Don't insult me like that. I want to marry you for your money. You don't want to marry me. You just don't know how else to get my money. So it's so insulting. And don't, you know, don't play me for the fool. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm marrying you for your money. So you, I'll just give you the money and you can leave now. Because you're not interested in me. Which is what ends up happening. <laughs> <laughs> in a lot of situations. Not voluntarily. Right. <laughs> yeah. God comes and says, I need you to serve my purpose, my plan. So, oh, I'll, I'll do it if it gets me to heaven. In other words, you don't want to do it. You just want heaven. It's so insulting. And it reflects on marriages. The way we treat God is the way we treat our, our, our spouse. So, and, and vice versa. So if there's no God, there's no foundation to even know how to treat your spouse. In marriage also, we're always looking for the payoff. Oh, uh, this is not what I thought it would be. Uh, what does that mean? That you didn't know what marriage was, now you do. So get with it. Oh, I thought it would give me... No, it's not going to give you anything. What are you giving? So, the truth is really so simple. And it's not, you don't have to get religious. You don't need a halo. You don't need a title. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're a righteous person. Mm -hmm. You're a saintly person. Stop it. I don't need to be righteous. God needs me. Here's, people think, uh, if I have to be that religious, I, it's not for me. I can't, I can't be that devoted. I'm not that type. Mm -hmm. You don't realize how you're serving God every single day. Anybody who goes to work and produces a useful product that makes life a little more livable for human beings, serving God. God said to Adam and Eve, I'm putting you in this world Fix it for me. It's a nasty little world. The lowest of all worlds. 
Fix it for me. Turn the lowest world into the highest world. So anything we do that makes this world a little more inviting, a little more pleasurable, mm -hmm. you're serving God's purpose. You're making his creation better. The guy who invented the electric toothbrush, going straight to heaven. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because, wow, you made it so much easier for people. Mm -hmm. Whoever invented a car, whoever invented a scooter, whoever invented the wheel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything you do that contributes to the improvement and betterment of life on earth, whose world are you improving? His, and, and, and he owes you for that. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic, and you're looking for more information, or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that. And that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal, it's questions and answers, it's conversation. It's really relaxed, it's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program, there's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look, click uh, the link below, and see which, which of the three suits you best, and join us for some enjoyable conversation.